The ancient Republic of Rome has been held up as the ideal of representative democracy, where order and freedom go hand in hand. It inspired the political structures of most Western democracies that exist today. So, how did the ancient Romans govern their republic, and why did it fail? Welcome to Inventing Civilization. In this episode, we travel to ancient Rome. The city of Rome in its early days found itself at a crossroads. The southern half of the Italian peninsula had been settled by the Greeks and the northern half was dominated by the advanced civilization of the Etruscans. Rome itself was of no significance at this point in history and it would appear the city was ruled by kings of Etruscan origin, with the Senate a relatively insignificant advisory council. The last king of Rome was a tyrant and he was overthrown. We're not sure exactly how the Romans managed to ditch their king, no written sources have come down to us, and later Roman historians constructed an elaborate founding myth that we can't take too seriously, or literally. But what we do know is that the Romans replaced their last king with a duo-consulship. They replaced one tyrant with two elected leaders. They were determined to find a balance of power that would prevent any one single individual from dominating absolutely. It was this determination on which the Roman constitution was founded, but it was, as we will learn, fundamentally at odds with Roman political culture, making the Republic doomed to fail. First, I should make it clear that Rome didn't have a constitution in the sense of a single written document like most modern countries do. It was instead a set of unwritten customs and political traditions handed down through the ages. The Romans had idolized their forefathers, and the notion of unwritten ancestral custom, or mos maiorum, was very important to them. The constitution was a part of that, and because it was unwritten, it evolved tremendously throughout the centuries. That being said, what the Roman constitution boiled down to at the height of the Republic in the 3rd and 2nd centuries BCE was that decisions depended on collaboration between three groups, the popular assemblies, the magistrates, and the senate. Let's start with the popular assemblies. They were open to all free male Roman citizens. There were several of them, but two of them were the most important, the Comitia Centuriata and the Comitia Tributa. At the height of the Republic, the Comitia Centuriata had the authority to declare war and to elect the highest magistrates, while the Comitia Tributa was the main legislative assembly and it elected lower magistrates. Now, while the various comitia may have had legislative functions, they were subject to a great deal of limitations. The comitia could only reject or approve proposals that were put before it by magistrates, but they didn't have the power of initiative or amendment. The use of complicated voting districts and procedures, as well as simple practical limitations, also meant there wasn't any such notion as one man, one vote, and the wealthy had more power than the poor. So the democratic aspect of the Roman constitution was quite limited. The offices of the magistrates, meanwhile, who were elected by the Comitia, is where the executive power of the Republic resided. The highest of these, of course, were the two consuls, the positions that had replaced the ancient kings of Rome. But other positions included praetor with judicial duties, aedile in charge of things like markets and the roads, and quaestor who assisted with affairs of the treasury and the archives. The power of the magistrates lay in their authority to run the day-to-day -day affairs of the state, in which they were given relatively free reign. They also had the power of initiative, meaning nothing could be done without them. But their influence was limited by the fact that they were not organized in group form, meaning long-term policy strategies still had to come from the Senate. Magistrates also served rather briefly, terms lasted only one year, and no one could serve twice. In reality, the various offices of the magistrates served as a career ladder for politically ambitious Romans, with the consulship the ultimate prize. But once they had served all their terms, they had no other choice but to fall back on the body that held the true power in the Republic, the Senate. Now, the Senate really was an odd beast from our 21st century viewpoint. It had no legislative or executive powers, it was an advisory body. But because it was a collection of the wealthiest, most influential and most experienced citizens that wasn't accountable to anyone or anything, its advice carried tremendous weight, particularly in matters of empire and foreign policy. In practice, magistrates would re really refrain from submitting bills that didn't have the approval of the Senate and the Comitia would rarely vote against the Senate's advice. So its influence overall was huge. 
The Roman constitution then was a mixed constitution, and as the letters SPQR indicated, the Republic was ruled by the Senate and the people of Rome, very much in that order. Now, I should point out at this stage that there is some scholarly dissonance on this subject. Because Rome didn't have a written constitution and its system evolved throughout the centuries, it can be difficult to assess exactly how democratic or aristocratic the Republic really was. Personally, I'm of the persuasion that democracy was in the passenger seat and the buck stopped with the Senate. So, if the Romans thought they had found the perfectly balanced compromise of a constitution capable of changing with the times without losing touch with its origins, why then did it fail? To find the answer to that question, we have to examine Roman political culture, more specifically the concepts of virtus, gloria and dignitas. But I should start by explaining that Rome was a warrior culture. Earlier I said the various magistrate positions formed a career ladder for the ambitious Romans, but the same applied to military service. In higher positions these two actually merged together. The magistrate positions of praetor and consul involved leading armies in the field. And on the battlefield is where a Roman citizen could display his virtus. Virtus was a complicated notion which you might translate as valor. It consisted of various qualities that a great citizen would be expected to have, such as patientia, meaning endurance and steadfastness, audacia, meaning audacity, and prudentia, meaning foresight and cunning. Should you display all of this in an impressive manner on the battlefield, you were then rewarded with gloria, meaning renown. This would set you apart from other men and greatly increase your chances of getting elected to higher magistrate offices. Now, crucially, you didn't just do this for yourself, but for your ancestors and your children as well. The virtus and gloria of your forefathers reflected on you, and it was your duty to live up to that and to pass it along to your children. Displaying your virtus on the battlefield and winning gloria magnified your dignitas, from which we get our word dignity, but it meant more than that. Dignitas was the sum of you and your family's worth, and the value of your entire family line to the greater good, the commonwealth, or res publica. Whoever possessed the most dignitas wielded the most influence in the Senate. The Romans thought this so important that they would literally start a civil war by leading soldiers loyal to them in defense of their own personal dignitas if they felt offended. Indeed, that's exactly what Sulla Pompeius and Julius Caesar did. So, the need really to increase one's dignitas by displaying virtus and winning gloria on the battlefield, as well as the importance of defending your dignitas with force, inevitably undermined the Republic's peaceful balance of power. It also created a political culture in which it became inevitable that one man with unrivaled dignitas could claim the leadership of the Republic, which is a fair description of how the first emperor Augustus came to power. So, in conclusion, the mixed constitution of Rome offered an alternative to the chaotic democracy of ancient Athens. It combined elements of monarchy, aristocracy and democracy into a single system where every citizen could have a say, even though they were far from equal. But Roman political culture ultimately spelled the end of this unique experiment in government, Although, of course, there were many other factors at play in the fall of the Republic, ultimately we have to conclude that the mixed constitution of Rome was no match for the relentless competition between individual leaders for ever greater dignitas and power. Well, that concludes this episode. I hope you've enjoyed it. As ever, if you'd like to learn more or if you'd like to cite this video, you can find a whole bunch of information in the description box below. For now, though, I want to thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Goodbye.